left in this world, few are more so than missing one's train, especially when it happens to be the last of the day. This unpleasant experience happened to me one evening early in September 1895. I came into Euston just as at 7 p.m. for Northampton. The last train connected with Bricksworth was steaming out of the station, and so, willy-nilly, I had to remain in town all night. Where to put up now became the absorbing question. I wanted to be close to the station in order to catch the earliest morning train, but, although there were plenty of rich men's hotels, there seemed a sore dearth of go-betweens. It was either five shillings a night or sixpence, purgatory or hell. I could see no place that suited me. At last, after traversing many squares and the more respectable of the side streets, I retraced my steps, eventually lighting on a private and inconsequential-looking hotel in Euston Road. The interior of the establishment was in keeping with the exterior, gloomy and forbidding, and the damp, earthy smell that seemed to rise from the basement made me gravely apprehensive of rheumatism. Still, the tariff was in strict accordance with my means, and feeling too tired to wander further, I decided to remain. The room in which I had taken a very sparse supper was like the majority of dining rooms in middle-class hotels, overcrowded with unwieldy furniture, frowsy, ill-ventilated. Imagine that the table had been laid once, and for all, it had undoubtedly presented the same spectacle for months and that the cloth, never very white, was removed only when it grew too begrimed for even the blunted sensibilities of the proprietress. I afterward found out the beef did not belie its looks, that the bread was in excellent accord, and that the water might well have been the receptacle of innumerable generations of bacilli. There were other visitors beside myself, either Germans or commercial travelers, probably both, but as their conversation carried on over plates of half-raw meat, was neither particularly edifying nor interesting. I preferred an antique number of Vanity Fair, until, at length, tired of that, I picked up a candlestick and made my way to bed. The moment I crossed the threshold of my room, an indefinable sensation that invariably suggested the immediate proximity of the superphysical came over me. I felt sure the house was haunted, but by what? Ah, that was the problem left for me to solve. The furniture of the room was the orthodox lodging house type, inartistic, scant, and seedy. A gaunt four-poster propped against the middle of the wall, running at right angles to the door, was adorned with exceedingly dirty valances of a nondescript pink and white pattern. Facing this was a fireplace, the register of which was, of course, down. To the left of this was a hanging wardrobe that I at once examined and found to contain nothing more formidable than a score or two of black beetles that scuttled unceremoniously away into the holes at the side of my candle. Whilst on the opposite side of the room, facing the window, was a rickety dressing table surmounted by a still more rickety looking glass. In one corner of the room stood a washing stand from which the white paint had peeled in a hundred places and in the other corner a dismantled bureau that resembled some vessel after a great storm. These, I believe, apart from a couple of cane-bottomed chairs, constituted the entire furniture, nor can I say this scantiness, taking into consideration the poorness of the quality, was any matter of regret. The carpet undoubtedly the best feature of the room, and either an Axminster or a Brussels, not being an expert in such a point I cannot tell which, hid all the boarding save where the margins were stained with the preparation of potash. I give all these details to show that several years of practical investigation of haunted houses had developed my inquiring faculties to a very high degree. Little, if anything, escaped my notice. The raison d'etre of ghosts often lies where it is least expected. In some article of furniture, not infrequently a cupboard near at hand, in the paneling, the skirting, nor, not infrequently again, on or under the boards. When I am in a haunted room, my first instinct, therefore, is to take a very careful stock of my surroundings, the bare appearance or touch of a piece of furniture often supplying me with the necessary clue. On this occasion, however, nothing arousing my suspicions, in feeling abnormally sleepy, I bolted my door and lay on the bed. I say on, not in, as a cursory glance at the pillow made me draw deductions as to the sheets. Within a few minutes I fell asleep, falling into a heavy, dreamless slumber, from which I was suddenly and most alarmingly awakened by the feeling I was no longer alone in the room. 
opening my eyes, I perceived the apartment flooded with a bright, unnatural light that apparently emanated from, or at all events accompanied, the figure of a little old woman with yellow hair and a heliotrope skirt. I noticed these idiosyncrasies of person and dress directly, the nature of the light accentuating them, and my senses being, as they always are in the presence of the superphysical phenomena, wonderfully and painfully acute. Standing in front of the dressing table, the eccentric individual was examining herself with the greatest curiosity in the crazy looking glass to which allusion has already been made. Her profile was angular, her lack of color ghastly, whilst from her ears hung that style of drop earring worn by ladies in the days of crinoline. Otherwise, her costume might have belonged to the latter seventies or early eighties. There was nothing actually horrible about her, save her reflection, and as my eyes turned with irresistible fascination towards the looking-glass, my blood turned to ice. The surface of the mirror, made preternaturally bright, flashed back the most hideous, the most incomparable hideousness, image of fear. Never, never in all my life have I seen depicted in aught but words as pictures of such inconceivable, awful terror as that which confronted me there. And now as I gazed at it, a sickly curiosity seized me as to what could be the origin of such hellish fear. Was it fear of death, of the unknown metatherical abysses, of eternal damnation, of what? Then, as I followed the direction of the dilating pupils, I saw, God help me, the cause, descending from a few inches above her head were the snake-like coils of a rope. Had I been able to turn my head, maybe I should have seen whence they came. But I could not move a muscle and could only feel the keynote of some great and hitherto unsolvable mystery was at hand, but purposely hidden from me. There was scant time for speculation. The enactment of this drama was brief as it was lurid. Uttering an appalling scream that was quickly converted into a gurgle of the most blood-curdling significance, the old lady clawed the air with her spidery fingers. The murderer was pitiless, the noose coming to with an irresistible snap jerked the wretched victim off her feet. For one instant, the most harrowing of all, I watched her falling backward, watched the changing of her deadly pallor into a deep and vivid purple, watched the rolling of her starting eyeballs, the foam flakes on her lips, and the frenzied movement of her stiffening arms, and then, then, as she struck the ground with a reverberating crash, all was darkness. The ghostly tragedy for this night, at least, was over. This I realized, but my nerves being too completely unstrung by what I had witnessed to allow me to sleep, I crept under the counterpane and lay there shivering till the welcome rays of early dawn converted the room into another place. My first movement was to examine the scene of the ghostly murder, and upon turning up the carpet I discovered not a blood stain, but a comparatively new piece of boarding. With that, drawing my own conclusions, I had to rest content. There was nothing else in the room that could in any way have been transmuted into evidence. The moment the clock struck six, I picked up my valise and, gobbling down a lukewarm breakfast with little relish, quitted the house, determined to pay it another visit before very long. In this, however, I was doomed to disappointment. Some months elapsed before I could again visit the neighborhood of Euston, and when I did so, I found the hotel had vanished, nor have I to this day been able to identify the house wherein I slept. I have but lately been informed that a good many years ago, when we middle-aged fogies were mere children, a singularly repulsive murder was committed at a house in or near Euston Road, the victim being a somewhat extraordinary old lady. Further details I do not know, therefore I can only surmise that what I saw may possibly have been her phantasm. But please remember, it is only a surmise. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 Penmar Hollow, Marionette, The Black Peddler the Ladies' Cabinet for 1835 contains an account of a haunting in Marionette which seems to me of sufficient psychic interest to record. Hence, I append it. But since the original text is a trifle too intricate in places, I have taken the liberty to tell the story more or less in my own words. In the summer of 1832, I was on a walking tour in Wales, in selecting as a principal scene of my operations Marionette. In chancing one evening to be overtaken by a storm, when midday between Dolgelly and Bala, I was speedily placed in the most unpleasant of predicaments. To go on I was afraid. To turn back was impossible. What could I do? The night was dark, the rain almost tropical, and the roadway so broken up with furrows that I could only grope along with the utmost difficulty, whilst the frequent windings, steep ascents, 
and sharp declivities not only added to my embarrassment, but greatly increased my weariness. At every few yards I either plunged into a miniature morass or, stumbling over a boulder, found myself smarting in the center of a gorse bush. At length I grew desperate. Human nature could stand it no longer, and resolving to perish with the cold rather than flounder under such pitiable conditions, I threw myself down on a rock and prepared to lie there till daybreak. It is possible I had remained in this position for ten or so minutes when I was roused by a sense of deliverance by the bright glow of a lamp, and starting to my feet I discovered I was no longer alone. Confronting me was the figure of a short man, wrapped in a shaggy greatcoat and wearing a slouched hat. He was holding a lantern in his hand. By a series of pantomimic gestures, he assured me that his intentions were amicable, and that he was anxious to guide me to some place of shelter where I should have a more comfortable pallet than a bare rock. I accepted his offer, though not without some misgivings, as I could not remember ever having met anyone quite so uncouth or bizarre. Turning abruptly to the right, he struck across a wide moor covered with gorse and innumerable boulders, and so studded with pools of water that I seemed to be in a perpetual state of waiting. Emerging from this, we wended our way along the side of a precipice, at the bottom of which roared one of those mountain torrents so characteristic of all parts of Wales. Beckoning me to follow, my guide mysteriously disappeared, and peering over the edge of the chasm, I perceived him, to my amazement, making his descent by an almost invisible and perpendicular pathway. For a second or so I hesitated, and then making up my mind to brave anything rather than remain by myself in such an unfamiliar and dangerous neighborhood, I gingerly lowered myself down over the brink, and, after a few tumbles, succeeded in overtaking him just as he arrived at the bottom. We now found ourselves in a valley of Stygian darkness, and of such restricted dimensions that the spray from the river bathed me from head to foot. My companion pressed resolutely on, and, maintaining the same extraordinary and uncanny silence, conducted me to a recess in the hillside where the outlines of a bare, dismantled house gradually rose to greet us. It was merely a pile of ruins, old yet naked, without any of those evidences of vegetation one usually associates with the antique. I particularly noticed this deficiency. It impressed and perplexed me. If moss and lichens grew elsewhere, why not here? The situation of the house was strikingly romantic and weird. Indeed, one could not well imagine a more dismal spot. A giant mass of black rock reared itself up in the background, like a Brobdenagian bat, in the foreground and at so close a distance that the spray blowing madly over my face and clothes drenched me to the skin, rushed a seething mass of sable water, whilst to accentuate all this Avernian horror, the wind whistled demonically, and the rain fell in ever-increasing fury. Turning to my guide, I impatiently requested him to move on and take me with the greatest expedition to the nearest available hostelry. In reply, he took up his hat, and thrusting his monstrous head forward, revealed to my horror-stricken gaze a shapeless, sodden mass of black flesh. The cause of his silence was now obvious. He couldn't speak because he had no mouth, but neither had he eyes, ears, or nose. Nothing but that awful, unmeaning, rotund protuberance. I stood aghast, too terrified to stir, almost too terrified to breathe, with the hideous thing looming there before me, and the booming of the river behind, it was a ghastly situation. The creature advanced an inch. My blood turned to ice. It raised its arms. My soul sickened within me. It lunged suddenly forward and fell right through me. As it did so, I heard a fiendish chuckle, which, dying slowly out, gave way to a succession of blood-curdling groans that seemed to proceed from the interior of the ruins. The figure, however, was nowhere to be seen, it must have dematerialized from the spot. Very much relieved at this, though still considerably frightened, I was now able to use my limbs, and turning my back on the ghostly building, I felt my way along the bank of the river. I dare not glance at the boiling foam. The very sound of it made my flesh creep, nor did I feel in any degree safe till a winding of the footpath brought me to a bridge, on the opposite side of which I saw the twinkling lights of many houses. I was now, once again, in the land of the living, and a substantial meal by a cozy fire helped, in good measure, to dissipate my fears and recompense me for all the trials I had undergone. Prior to leaving the inn the next day, I learned from my host that the hollow was known to be haunted, and, on that account, was universally shunned after sunset. Half a century ago, the ruins, then a neat grey cottage, had been inhabited by the Evanses, a bad, thriftless lot. At the instigation of her husband, 
Mrs. Evans, a buxom woman, handsome in a bad, bold style, had flirted openly with a peddler, known locally as Black Dave. This man was easily induced to put up at their house, and his suspicions being lulled to rest by the amorous overtures of the woman, he was surprised in his sleep and butchered. Fearing, however, either to commit the body to the river or bury it in their garden lest it should be found, and being at the time very hard pressed for food, they improvised an oven in the earth and ate it. The vengeance of heaven, however, was close on their track. The cottage, paid for out of their ill-gotten gains, caught fire during a drunken carousal, and Mrs. Evans was burned to death, whilst her husband only lingered long enough to make a full confession of the crime. The house was never rebuilt. The phantasm of Dave, in the disgusting guise in which he appeared to me, still haunts the precincts, and, delighting to gall unsuspected wayfarers, leads them out of their proper courses, guiding them with a fiendish skill to the black ruin, the scene of his ghastly murder. The End Chapter 10